we left off with uh, bare bones uh, uh, parliament with uh, Cromwell. So I wanted to pick up there and move into the protectorate. Now this is, uh, this is an important section uh, because in, with the protectorate, we get something that looks like a, a genuine uh, republic uh, the, in the way that we normally conceive of it with an executive. Um, <clears throat> but of course, when uh, when the Rump Parliament was was running uh, the Commonwealth, uh, that certainly qualifies as a republic. Uh, the only issue is that uh, you know it was instituted by a, a military coup uh, type operation. So um, also the protectorate, uh, the bare bones parliament here was put in by Cromwell uh, in a uh, military coup uh, action. And so, you know, that's always there. And, and uh, you know, so this is an issue that kind of, kind of uh, really comes up with the protectorate. Um, with the protectorate, uh, there was a, uh, the instrument of government, a, a document that was introduced um, by uh, some compatriots of Cromwell, and uh, it was adopted by the Council of Officers. So this is a small group of military officers, and it's the first written constitution of England. And it's based on the grandee's uh, head of proposal um, as an alternative to the agreement of the people put out by the levelers. And so it's much more conservative. It's not as um, it's not as generous with rights, especially to lower class uh, people and especially to wage earners. And um, uh, although we saw with the agreement of the people, there also was discrimination against uh, wage earners and people at the lower scale. But uh, but uh, the agreement of the people was really intended to give rights to soldiers who were uh, maybe free landholders, uh, these yeomen, free tenants, um, which, you know, maybe they conceived of as creating a kind of middle class that would have some rights along the lines of the rights of the nobility and, of course, wealthy people. Uh, could always manipulate things. Um, but the instrument of government's much more conservative and much more along the lines uh, of a you know, constitutional monarchy, but uh, there is no monarchy within the, the structure here. And so it is a genuine uh, republic. Uh, Cromwell is made the Lord Protector, and that's the position within the instrument of government for the executive. The, um, you know, the executive prior to this was the monarch. So an executive is a, is a single person that can run the government on a day-to-day -day basis and make quick decisions that need to be made just to keep things functioning. Uh, and also to make quick decisions in times of emergency. Um, and so uh, up until this point in the Commonwealth, there's no executive, everything's ruled by parliamentary procedure and that can be very messy and very time consuming. Uh, so uh, putting in uh, an executive position, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense, especially if you're someone like Cromwell who's thinking about, you know, military threats and things like that. Um, now, What's interesting about Cromwell is he's not nobility. And I think this is a big turning point in the English Revolution is now you have an executive for the first time in England that is not nobility. And uh, so technically he is a person at the lowest stratum of society amongst the commoners. And uh, he is landed gentry. So he comes from a family that has held land uh, over generations, but not with any sort of noble title. It's not part of the peerage. And there's really a, a distinction. Uh, you know, the Magna Carta only applied to nobles. It was only a bill of rights, you know, uh, for nobles. So here we have a, a, a big 
a big break with the tradition of England and um, Cromwell, you know, his position is secured and, and uh, makes sense within the political climate because of his success as a grandee in the New Model Army, especially in his uh, Scottish expedition where he, he expelled uh, Charles II from England, uh, from, from England and Scotland. Now the Lord Protector position is a life term and, um, and Cromwell's merely elected by the Council of Officers just by a handful of people. So uh, not very democratic. And the Protectorate in general at, at, at various times resembles a military dictatorship, um, but, um, but it, you know, sometimes resembling something like a Latin American dictatorship in the 20th century. But that's not really the case. Um, the parliament, uh, you know, following the conditions of the instrument of government, had a lot of control over the Lord Protector, Cromwell. Uh, and so uh, it's not arbitrary power being exercised by a single person. There is a larger body of people that are, that are uh, constraining the power of the individual leader. Uh, which is, you know, what constitutes a republic is you may have a, a figurehead leader, but they're strongly controlled uh, by a larger body that's at least uh, somewhat democratically elected in some way. Uh, you know, and, and now we see very, uh, very clear similarities with the U.S. Constitution. We have an executive, the president. And the power of the executive is constrained by the judiciary, the Supreme Court, and by the legislative branch, the uh, Congress, which has two houses. You know, we have the upper house, the Senate, and the lower house, the House of Representatives. And so uh, that. Um, that you know the structure of our constitution in part is is due to the experience of the protectorate now at this time there's only the house of commons so parliament is just a single house remember they got rid of the house of lords um, but you know this whole tradition plays into um, the way that the u.s constitution was formed and we'll see another rendition of a written constitution here quickly that that um, then brings back the second house in the parliament Okay, so, uh, you know, then there's several uh, uh, parliaments during the protectorate. This is, you know, uh, after the bare bones parliament, which was just hand selected by Cromwell and the, the Council of Officers, they have uh, elections that are much more broad based. Um, but not entirely as uh, free as some elections had been prior to this. Um, they, they sort of manipulated things to make sure that they had people that they could work with, right? Um, and then in the second, and so the first parliament in the protectorate, that when it says the first parliament, that means it's uh, an election happened. And then the second parliament happened and they have a, a, a couple of sessions, so they, they get prorogued and then they come back. Um, and uh, in the first session, there is uh, the humble petition at advice, uh, which is another document that's a constitutional document. And this does get adopted as the second written constitution of of England and the last written constitution of England. Um, prior to this, England did not have a written constitution. And then after this whole story is over, uh, these written constitutions no longer play a role in the, in the constitutional structure of England. So England operates without a written constitution. Uh, but in the United States, we have a written constitution and that seems to go back to the experience with the protectorate here. The, you know, looking at the history and seeing what worked and what didn't work. Obviously, it didn't work out in the long run. But um, 
This does get it adopted, but originally in the original draft, it had a hereditary monarchy for Cromwell. So that Cromwell and his descendants would be the Lord, Lord Protector uh, in perpetuity. Um, Cromwell refuses this uh, under pressure. It does seem that he at first um, seriously considered reverting to a monarchy, uh, but uh, but but then uh, but then ultimately ended up refusing uh, because that would have caused a much uh, chaos uh, amongst his support. Uh, they did add the upper chamber here, so now we have an upper chamber merely referred as the other chamber in the document, uh, but it but it is the higher chamber that's stipulated. So we're getting something that looks like the House of Lords, or maybe something like what we call our Senate not necessarily based on nobility, but it is uh, uh, an upper house that is more selective in, in its constitution and, and the people that can be elected to it. Um, so this is adopted in, in the first session of the second uh, parliament. And then in the second session, uh, Cromwell stuffs the upper chamber. He hand selects the people in the upper chamber. So um, the lower chamber, the lower house has has um, more free elections, but the upper house Cromwell has constrained so that only certain people can be elected there. Uh, people that are, you know, favorable to his policies and loyal to him. And um, this causes protest in the House of Commons. And Cromwell quickly dissolves the, uh, the second parliament. And then Cromwell dies uh, not long after that. So at the, you know, the end of Cromwell's tenure, there's a lot of chaos and there's no clear succession strategy. Because if it isn't a hereditary monarchy, then who is going to be the Lord Protector? Um, Richard Cromwell is merely told he's he's the Lord Protector. It's not clear, uh, you know. The humble petition and advice doesn't uh, have a clear succession strategy, and there's some confusion in the historical record, and it seems like there was confusion at the time as to whether. Uh, Oliver Cromwell had nominated his son and, and then people just took that to be what happens next or whether the council of officers just merely put him in there. Uh, we do know that the council of officers were loyal to Cromwell and had made promises to take care of Richard, his son. And, um, and so there may have just been some informal discussions on their part and saying, okay, we got to put Richard in there. This is what's going to happen. Uh, but it's not, um, it's not a, a, a good succession strategy. And for one thing, Richard is, um, is not a military officer. He doesn't have any military experience. He's a civilian and he doesn't have any political experience. So he's not really well qualified for the, the job. Evidently, the Council of Officers thinks that they can work with them and, and get him up to speed. Uh, and so they, they uh, call a third parliament. There's a, an election held. And quickly, when, when they meet, uh, factions appear. There's you know, a, a good contingent of those that like the protectorate and, and like Richard are loyal to uh, Cromwell, to Oliver, and therefore loyal to his son. There are the, there's the Commonwealth men who want to return to more of a republic, something that has a, a weaker Lord Protector. And so they want to constrain uh, the Lord Protector more and make it more of a republic. And um, to go back something to the earlier part, you know, at first it was the rump parliament that was running that was running the Commonwealth in parliamentary style without an executive. The Commonwealth men want something of an executive, but a weak executive. And then there's the members of the Rump Parliament that remember, you know, 
the way that things ran without an executive. And they all had different sort of attitudes about how to proceed. They are unable to form a, a stable government. They can't, they can't decide on a direction. And the Council of Officers ultimately blocks the chambers and in a military coup, you know, eliminates um, the third parliament. So they dissolve the third parliament in a coup action. Uh, so the Council of Officers is very much in control because at any time they can just pull the plug on it. And, and they were used to that when Cromwell was around because Cromwell then could put a public face on it and, and do the, the propagandistic political stuff to make it all kind of fly. But, um, but without Cromwell, it's not as effective. And so what the Council of Officers does is they, they restore the rump parliament. So those same people that were elected to the long parliament, and then the, then and and then those who were not secluded, the remainder, the rump, they bring that parliament back. And so this is how the long parliament really gets its name because the rump parliament is part of the long parliament. And although there's parliaments in between, now we have like a restoration of the rump parliament. And the uh, in in doing this, the Council of Officers just remove Richard. Again, they're very loyal to Oliver Cromwell and loyal to Richard as well to to take care of him. But they decide, you know, he can't run things, and they just tell him that he has to step aside. And then they call the Rump Parliament, and then the very next day. They have armed troops uh, uh, escorting the rump parliament into chambers. Uh, but that doesn't last long. The rump parliament also doesn't, you know, uh, come up with a good strategy. There's a lot of chaos, and ultimately the Council of Officers block entry to the rump parliament and now they seem to be moving in the direction of a military dictatorship just by this small group of officers. And, <clears throat> and there are a couple of leading generals that, that may take control in some sort of absolutist military dictatorship. Uh, the Navy sides with Parliament, with the Rump Parliament, and once the Navy sides with the Rump Parliament, it's all over for the Council of Officers because the Navy can block ports and um, you know shut down the economy. So it doesn't take much uh, uh, of a threat for the Council of Officers to back down and to lose a general support, and especially to lose support from the City of London. You know that that's a, a big source of power in in this situation, and so. The Rump Parliament is restored by the Navy, by Navy officers who come in and escort the Rump Parliament into chambers and protect them in December of uh, 1659. Meanwhile, George Monk is up in Scotland. He is a grandee of the New Model Army and he's the Supreme Commander in Scotland. And he also sides with the Rump Parliament uh, right around the same time as the Navy does, but the Navy is positioned to enter London quickly. George Monk is up in Scotland, but he begins to march south towards England uh, with his army. And um, the Council of Officers send, send uh, troops north to meet him, but uh, there's a lot of desertions from the the loyalist uh, to the Council of Officers. Um, it seems like Monk and the Rump has the consent of the people in some way. And Monk meets little resistance, some resistance, but not much, and then ultimately just marches into London. And then in February, Monk, uh, a little, again, uh, 
perturbed by the ineffectiveness of the rump parliament, just like the Council of Officers was. So he sees what's going on. It's, it's not a good picture, but he forcibly reinstates the members of of a parliament secluded in Pride's Purge. So this is the House of Lords and other um, what were royalists at the time of Pride's Purge. Uh, they reinstate those people into the parliament. Now we have the long parliament fully restored. And remember that the long parliament, the first thing that they passed was an act that said, and they forced this through with Charles uh, the first, is that um, the long parliament or, or any parliament could not be dissolved without its own consent. Okay, um, but now we get a, a parliament that, that is uh, royalist in, in nature. It has a majority of royalists. Um, the new parliament is called and within a month, the long parliament dissolves itself very quickly with Monk there with all of his troops sort of watching over everything. Uh, so it's a little suspicious uh, in, in that regard, but also it's suspicious because they didn't ha even have an adequate quorum to dissolve parliament according to the act instituted by the long parliament in the first place. So it's a little sketchy, this, this dissolution of the long parliament. But now that's the end of the long parliament. Um, uh, quite a roller coaster ride of events. And that was England's experiment with Republican government structure. And they never returned to Republican structure. But as I said earlier, this serves as experience for the foundation of the United States and the Constitution of the United States. All right, so I'm going to leave that off there and then we'll talk about the restoration of absolute monarchy.